microbiology at the University of Washington. Uh, he's interested in becoming uh, affiliated with the astrobiology program and he's the advisor of, PhD advisor of Aaron Goldman and he'll be talking today on modelling proteomes. So um, I decided to introduce myself. But can we get some lights there? So um, the fundamental question that me and my group and I and since have been five years old trying to understand is how does the genome of an organism specify its behavior and characteristics? I um, and you know I've been told that there's a mixed audience of astronomers and biologists, and I fundamentally believe that uh, evolution, understanding evolution, is a way to understand um, how life occurred on Earth and also how to design or see other planets with life. If that's, if that's you know, relevant to astrobiology, and I think it is. So actually, so the title of my talk has changed a little bit because it's modern for you, because I went back to some of my older slides, some of my older work, because that I thought was more relevant. And our focus mostly has been on proteins and proteomes. I mean, proteomes and sculptures of proteins. I'll define all these terms, but um, uh, so, so our focus has been on proteins, and so I wanted to, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that. As I go through the talk, I, you know, I was, I was going through it like a couple of days ago, and I was thinking maybe I should annotate every astrobiological aspect of it, and then I thought hopefully I will be able to do it verbally. It'll save me time, and uh, and I'm just being lazy. So, let's start with the thing. Let's start with the fundamental question: How does the genome of an organism specify its behavior characteristics? If we can do that, if we can understand that here on Earth in extreme environments, we can do that anywhere. We can do it on Jupiter, we can do it on Mars, we can do it on you know, Neptune. So, and the way we propose to answer this question is by doing something called modeling proteomes. Uh, the modeling part should be hopefully obvious. Modeling means that I do only computational work. Everything that we do is computer simulation. We do not do any experimental work, but we do collaborate with experimentalists who verify our experimental techniques. And I will give you a lot of data on that, and that data may not be so immediately relevant to astrobiology, but I want to make it very clear how relevant it would be um, to, to astrobiology. In the sense that what we are doing is developing a sense of a set of tools and techniques that is relevant to a huge number of disciplines and it's very broad and very general. And what do I mean by proteo? Okay. Um, oh, that one. So a proteome in, in general to me is just a collection of proteins. And when, when you talk about interactome, which is the original title of my talk, I didn't want to get into that. It's the collection of the, the uh, biologically relevant molecules, if you want to call it that. But in life, in this planet, uh, almost everything, functions of life are carried out by proteins. So in this case, what I've done is, a proteome is a system, and the system is circled by this blue box here. And the proteins by themselves, the individual objects, are colored in black boxes. So we don't know what they do. So the first job is to understand what, what each protein does on a molecular level. And what I want to say is to give you an idea of what happens. In a, if you want to evolve a complex organism in some other, organi in, in some other environment, uh, let's say an extreme environment on Earth or an extreme environment on another planet, you really want to look at what, what it takes. There are about 60,000 open reading frames or, yeah, or proteins in humans that we are looking at. And, um, Rice is another model organism that we're looking at very seriously. It's uh, one of my sources of funding. It's got 60,000. Rice is one of the smaller uh, plant genomes. So things like onion and uh, wheat and maize and so on have much, 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 much larger number of proteins. So we need to understand why that is happening. And then, but, but, but let's say just we want to grow bacteria in you know, Jupiter. There's about 4,500 genes. And there's something called a minimal genome project, which I won't go into, into in detail, but that is 
trying to find the minimal set of proteins that will let an organism survive under specific conditions. It could be a highly thermophilic condition, it could be a highly um, varying condition, but that, that's, uh, that was actually initiated by Craig Venter at, at Tiger, and uh, that turns out to be about, um, I think uh, the estimate has turned out to be about a 400 to 5 genes. So we were involved in trying to predict the functions and trying to get the proteome of that 400 genes and trying to put it all together, and I'll go into that into more detail. So no matter what we do, why am I saying it's 400? Why do we, even though there are 60,000 in humans, 60,000 in rice, and even 4,000 in small bacteria, there are 400 because um, <coughs> all of these proteins that are there together can be grouped into several thousand distinct sequence families. And this is where evolution comes into account. So everything evolved from something, ever, something else. And so you have evolutionary divergence, which is you know, something evolved and, and then you have, a, you have some variants of that and that perform maybe different functions, maybe different structures and so on. And in your evolution convergence, things that need to perform the same function and by chance they arrive at the same answer, but that is by chance, at least by current Darwin Indian theory. So what the basic point here is that even though we have a large number of proteins in all these organisms, these proteins can be grouped into several thousand distinct sequence families. Is that going into still uh, too much uh, uh, abstractness? No, 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 I'm just uh, still wondering what a sequence family is. Just similarities? Uh, uh, yeah, sequence. similarities of sequence, yes. Evolution and relatedness. Defined mathematically is yes. cross yeah. correlation between yes. it, it's It's homology, actually. The, the exact word is it, homology, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the, well, it's homology or analogy in the sense that they are either divergent or they're convergent. But yeah, they're similar, similar and they perform, and they look similar. The sequences look similar at the sequence level again. Uh, I'll go a little bit into what proteins really are in a minute, but the first thing that we want to understand, we want to remove those black boxes out. Those are black boxes for a reason, because we don't understand what they do. So we want to understand what they look like, because everything that happens in life, in physics, I mean, it's all atomic interaction. So if you think about us as the universe, uh, we're, we're just a bunch of atoms, you know, in collections together, and we're interacting in some ways. And uh, right now we're interacting in, in, in a particular way. And so in going back to these molecular systems that we're talking about, our proteins, we want to understand what these uh, proteins look like at an atomic level. We want to understand the precise coordinates. We want to understand every atom, at least, at least the heavy atoms. That's what we focus on. And so we want to understand the position of every atom. And here's the interesting part about this. So even though there are many, many thousands, several thousand distinct sequence families, the number of structures, structural families, that is structures that are similar to each other by some measure, say root mean square deviation or whatever, when you superimpose them, they are uh, very few actually. Um, so there was a paper in Nature proposed by Sarah Shotia who said there's only a thousand, but it's, it's in the order of that much. We, we probably have about 600 unique protein families uh, in terms of structure, and every year there's probably one or two being discovered. So we are at the tail end of the distribution. So we've discovered pretty much all the sequence families that we can using standard experimental techniques, that is X-ray diffraction and MR spectroscopy. There might be a class of proteins that we haven't discovered yet uh, or the structures yet using new methods, but, but for using current experimental techniques, uh, there are only a few thousand distinct structural force. What that means is that evolution is reusing this, these structures again and again to perform many, many, and I'll get to the next slide, uh, to perform many, many different functions. And that's, so. That's in all species, that, that few thousand. Yep. This is over, this is over, yeah, every single protein. I mean, millions and millions of sequences. Every, every protein in the human, I mean, sorry, every protein on Earth that has been sequenced, every gene in the protein that has been sequenced, that has been talked as a, as, a, as a protein, as an open reading frame. So everything, there's only a few thousand structural shapes that they adopt. So there are structural atomic shapes. So that's where we are working on. We are working at that level, at the atomic shape level. So 
you might think that that would mean that would be you know that would make our problems easy but actually it doesn't it actually makes our problem very very hard because even though the sequence there are only several thousand sequence families and a few thousand structural folds maybe a thousand structural folds we are about 600 right now and there's a tail end of the distribution and it might be a long tail i don't know but there are tens and thousands of functions millions of functions right now proteins do many 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 things uh they let me talk right now and they do everything and even though they have the same shape they look the same uh um by by any you know if you look at it by eye, they will look the same to you uh but by by some mechanism uh which we can rationalize uh but if you look carefully enough uh they do different different things so again it goes back to the spawn of evolution we're using the same sequence and same structure again and again to do many 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 different things and so it goes back to the issue of minimal genome and astrobiology so if you want to see the planet or other life what you want to do is get the minimal set of structures that you need for um for uh, an organism uh, to function properly now so far i've simplified the view a little bit i'm talking about individual proteins individual genes if you want to call it most familiar people are familiar with genes but each gene usually transcribes a protein and uh, we've talked about individual protein function and structure and sequence but what happens is it's it's an interconnected system it's a huge interconnected system and that's what we're trying to get at so what matters is this interconnected system expression so we want to know how many copies of each protein or each functional unit there are you can think of each protein as a functional unit we want to know how many copies of each functional unit there are and there are different expression patterns based on time and location based on the development of the organism in 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 earth at least and then we want to understand how they all interact together so yeah many copies of all these things we want to understand exactly how all these copies interact with each other to perform what we call the organism perform back you know and that's what i mean by and how does the genome of an organism specify its behavior and characteristics what i want to say though is, is a very fundamental basic point is that the interaction and expression the number of copies and how they interact are very interdependent with the molecular structure and function so we are trying to relate system when I mean in a, in a biological sense we call this aspect of its systems biology and then from the other side we call it biophysics biochemistry whatever but what we are trying to do is relate the two things together and this is what my group is trying to do and we have developed a set of technologies and tools that Aaron is working partly on um that 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 tries to get at it and what i'm going to do now for the remainder of the talk is actually going to results of what we our tools can do mostly the results rather than explaining what the tools do because that would that that itself would take a long time and uh, then i want to talk about some applications of these tools and the applications right now are not again astrobiological in in any sense but i want to talk about how they can be astrobiological and that's again something that that aaron has been challenged with okay so let's go back to the basics so if you're not following up to this point um I'm just going to give you a very brief background because Rudy I did ask me to and uh, I normally say I, I I don't like to insult my audiences with this but I won't say it this time is that there is a gene in for I mean there are many genes in your in your in in your body there are many genes that code for many proteins uh the codon system is pretty well worked out and one of the first projects my undergraduate did is actually try to figure out why did the codon system come out the way it did it was never published so i won't go into that into detail but uh it turns out that there are reasons for that but what happens is that three base pairs the genes are composed of dna and there are four types of dna uh nucleotides um deoxyribose nucleotides a t c and g we'll call them that you can look at it as letters on a string it doesn't matter and three pairs of those i mean pair sorry three sets of those code for one amino acid in a protein and again we are focused on protein so we work with we work at this level and there are 20 amino acids and they perform they have different chemical groups they perform different functions and that's what gives a protein 
that's what makes a protein one, one protein different from another protein. So if you have identical proteins that have all the amino acids the same, they will, should perform the same function, the same structure, and look the same. Uh, but if you are using a single change, a single mutation, it can cause a disease in your body that could kill you. So, uh, so there, there are 20 amino acids, and again, the 20 amino acids are indicated by single letter codes, like L is for leucine and K is for lysine. Um, I won't go into detail on those, but just assume that each, each, each amino acid encodes a different um, chemical function. What happens, and this is again a very simplified view of, of what we thought biology was at least 40 years ago, is that this sequence, uh, gene is transcribed and translated into this protein sequence, and it produces this pro protein. And when it produces this protein, it's in an unfolded state. And this is what really an amino acid kind of startle looks like. So you have this uh, uh, a, a very basic structure to it. It's got what we call a main chain. It's a linear chain. And then it's got this side group to it. That's what makes an amino acid different. So it's got, this is a lysine right here. This is a carboxyl right here and so on. And that's what makes each amino acid different. And we assume that when the protein is made, it looks like this. And we all also know that, that this is the case. Uh, and Fenson won the Nobel Prize for showing this is the case. But in general, a protein has to be folded and unfolded and refolded and folded again to be transported to other places and so on. So this happens a lot. So when it's initially made or maybe during certain conditions, it's unfolded. What happens, we also know, again, uh, well, what I want to say something about the characteristics of, this, characteristics of this state is that it's not unique. So this is fluctuating between many, 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 many different shapes. Again, we are talking about atomic level shapes, and I'll illustrate that in a minute. This is highly mobile, and it's inactive. So this is not the functional form of this protein. This doesn't do anything. And it's expanded, usually, and it's irregular. There, there, there's no order to it. There's nothing that you can look at this and say, oh, look, this is what it does. So what happens in nature, again, a very, very simplified view, and this is the problem that you're working on, uh, is that this, this chain of amino acids, this chain is actually a bunch of atoms. And each atom I've shown you, uh, it's, it's, it's a stick figure. So this is actually a ball right here. There's a ball right here. There's a ball right here with the radii of an atom. And this, this chain spontaneously self-organizes in a time scale of a second, less than a second, milliseconds even, for most proteins that, that we know of at least, uh, again, that, that, that are being experimentally characterized um, into this native biologically relevant state. And what do I mean by that? Uh, sorry. Yeah, so into this native biologically relevant state. So you have the carbon atoms, I've colored them in uh, gray right here. The oxygen atoms are colored in uh, red, and the nitrogen atoms are colored in blue. So this is what happens within, within a second, right, when the protein is made, and you let it fold up. And this is what happens very, very quickly. And that, that's an evolutionary process that has been optimized by, for most proteins, for billions of years of evolution. Uh, I mean, that's, 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 and that's what everything is derived from. That's why structure, stru doing this is a very, very hard problem for any organism, let alone us. And uh, so, so this is why structure is so conserved among most organisms. But looking at the protein like this, with a ball of atoms like that, doesn't tell you anything. I mean, in the sense that it doesn't reveal what, what the protein is about. So we look at it in a very abstract view. An abstract view is connecting the C-alpha atoms, or the carbon main chain atoms, is one atom that's common among all, the, all the, these amino acids, and we connect them together. And we also color the direction of chain from blue to red. So when you look at, look at it like this, then you can start seeing certain features of this protein. What are they? It's a very unique shape. This is a transcription factor. So it's a real protein. I'm not making it up. So it's a real, this is a transcription factor that transcribes other proteins. It makes other proteins. It doesn't make other proteins. So it has a very unique shape. Um, if you unfold it and refold it, it will fold back into the same state. So again, like I said, and since won the Nobel Prize for this, it's very precisely ordered. It's stable and it's functional. This is a functional form of the protein. And as you can see, it's globular and compact. Like, unlike the, the unfolded state. And it's got these regular substructures, what we call helices and sheets. So right here, you're looking at a helix, head down. And here, you're looking at a helix right here, and you're looking at a helix right there. 
and then you know, we call these things trends and uh, you know the, there's there's some some artistic license we take with that but we call them strands and these strands actually are hydrogen bond together and they form what we call a beta sheet so there's alpha helices and beta sheets and we use that knowledge in part to to do all our predictions <coughs> so so the, 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 the red and the blue ends is just to guide the eye with, in the spectrum of colors that uh, as to the order of things? Exactly. So the, the, there is an order to the protein. Right. And it goes from the end to the C terminus. When the protein is synthesized, it is, it is synthesized like that. It is synthesized oh, in see. that order. So you start with blue. You start with blue. The first blue right there. And then the next one is added. And the next one is added. And the next one is added. And that's done by other proteins. So, and, and actually messenger RNA and so on, it's a complex process, but that's, that's part of the ribosome. But, but um, yeah, so that's exactly right. So the, the chain goes from N to C, what we call the N terminal to the C terminal. So the hydrogen, the, the, the bonds are added in one direction. They do not go in the reverse direction as far as I know. And that would be I mean, an amazing discovery if somebody found out that uh, if it went in the reverse, reverse direction. But back to the astrobiological elements, we could engineer them. We, we as humans, we can do a lot of things, but we can engineer that. We can make things go in the reverse direction. But the way nature has selected things as, as evolutionally, it seems to be evolutionally more efficient, or it has chosen randomly to pick one way, and that is N to C. It, is, it goes in one direction. And would it fold the same way if you, if you made it the other way? If you unfolded and refolded it, um, you know, that's, I'm simplifying the picture a lot here, but yes, it would. Yes, it would. I mean, this is, if you, you know, somebody won a Nobel Prize for that, showing that, for showing exactly that, answering exactly that question, that you unfold Barney's and, and it, it's an enzyme and it refolds back to the same state. You unfold it, refolds back. Unfold it, refolds back. So, yeah, and it will fold in that direction. But it's not clear that the, well, the protein is made in the direction, but wh how it actually folds is actually not so clear. So, so that's actually, that's a very tricky question because you're saying how it's made versus how it's folding. And that's, that's, that's a distinction that uh, uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer to. That's probably one of the most fundamental and solved problems in biology. How does it, how does a protein fold? And we are trying to answer that, right? So, but but the way it's made is is definitely N to C. Every protein in this in this universe that we know of is made N to C. It's never made in the reverse direction. Okay, and there's never like you know parts of a protein made here and parts of a protein made here, and they join together and form a single chain. That 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 also we never know. I mean, they might form dimers, but they are single chains, one single long chain, and they're all connected by covalent bonds. That's that's what I mean by that. By, by a single chain. So that is the that is the problem that we're dealing with. So would he would he brought up a Kirsch correction? Can we take that sequence and can we predict the structure? And that's what I've spent a lot of my life working on, um, more than half my life I would say at this point. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's something that people have spent more than 50 years on. It's an unsolved problem, but we are making progress and we're very good at it. And we're getting very, very, not just my group. I mean, David Baker is another professor in biochemistry. He's one of the top uh, leaders in the world in doing this kind of thing. And in the Pacific Northwest, we are probably the only two people who can do this. And in the world, there's probably about a handful of people, like about five to 10 people who can do this. So, how can we measure what we're doing is right? There's, there are experimental techniques, X-ray diffraction and mass spectroscopy that tell you what a protein looks like. And I will not go into details on that, but, but just trust me on that when I say that there are ways to look at the protein structure at atomic level detail. And so that's our gold standard. And then we, we can do computation. For small proteins, when I say small, I mean 100 to 150 amino acids, that is about 300 uh, G, uh, base pairs 
uh, DNA basis, uh, we can actually predict the structure to pretty high accuracy I mean, in general on average. So you go from three angstroms to about six angstroms. So when I say when I use the measure angstrom, people think of it as a resolution, but it's actually the accuracy of the gold standard, the measure of the accuracy of the gold standard to what we are predicting. It's a deviation from that. It's a root mean squared deviation of the main, usually the main chain atoms, but but it can be anything. It can be all atoms, but this 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 plot will still stand. It's a CLFR RMSD in this case. So de novo. So we have methods. We have we have a computational method that will take just the sequence of the protein, or take the sequence of gene, which which can be made. The genetic code is being very well resolved. So once you have the genetic gene, you can form, you can figure out what the protein looks like, and then from the protein, you can figure out what how it will fold like using our methods, including David Baker's method. And we can predict structures on average to about three to six angstroms. I would actually say we can do this for 70% of the proteins that are uh, amenable to experiment by X-ray diffraction or NMR spectroscopy. And that's an important point, that, 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 that there are a lot of proteins out in the universe that, that are not amenable to these two experimental techniques. And I'm not even going to delve into that subject. But, um, but anything, we have these competitions every two years that measure how well we do in, in, these, in these issues. So we give, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, in a minute. But uh, the XMOS techniques actually do not cover all proteins. They do not cover membrane proteins. We are talking about very simple, uh, in, a, in a sense, a simple, simple protein that's soluble, globular, it falls nicely and well-behaved is what I call it, like, like to call it. And then there's homology. So, like I said, ev evolution reuses things again and again. So if we take advantage of that fact that evolution reuses structure again and again, uh, you can do something called uh, homology modeling or uh, I mean, uh, comparative modeling, and it's template-based. So you have the structure that has been solved experimentally and use that as your basis for modeling the protein of something that, that you don't know the answer to. And those can, those, those can rival experimental accuracy in some cases. So uh, a very small fraction of proteins that are as small as 100. The average size, the average domain size, so let's say the domain is a functional unit of a protein, the average domain size is about 200. Mm, so when I say there are 600 unique folds, unique shapes, I'm talking about domains, and I'm talking about unique chains that that you know you can splice the rest of the protein off, and they will still fold up into a shape. And uh, there's about 600 of them. There's 600 unique shapes. Now, now protein can be composed of it can be a long chain that's composed of like two, three domains or two, three shapes. But uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's there's about 600 of them, and we can get up to 150 right now. We could probably even do 200 if if we are pushed to do it. We, so it's just a matter of computational power. How many amino acids is that typically? Hmm? 200 amino acids. 200. Average, yeah. The average domain size is 200 amino acids of real proteins in nature. Yeah. So, so 200 times uh, three or 400 is the number of amino acids that you're simulating. That 200 right? times, I'm sorry. Two you say 200 amino acids in a domain was typical? Yeah. And you said 100 domains that you're doing? No, no, I, I didn't say anything about 100. I, I mean, I said 200 amino acids, and then uh, we can, we can, we can, there are, there are 600 unique domains. And for a given protein, and we don't know the answer to that, it can be with the de novo method. The, the, the method is called de novo for that reason. You just give me the sequence, and we can go up to 150. That's pretty much it right now. We can't do 200. So we can't even hit the average yet. But but we've pushed it. It's, it's a matter of computational power. It's not a matter of um, you know, the physics. Um, but with the with the co comparative method, we can go any any length. We can go thousands of minutes. In fact, a model of 3,000 of an acid protein. So that's, you know, 3,000 times 10, which is, yeah, 30,000 atoms. 
and then model that to like two angstroms or three angstroms RMST from the right real answer. So, so with, with the, we're using homology or evolution as a guide, uh, we, can, we can really go very far with the modeling process. But in a sense, we are starting from, from some, something and we're trying to make it move towards the right answer. And that, that refinement problem for the first time has been addressed two years ago and it's a still an unsolved problem. And then there are hybrid methods. So most proteins, I would say, I would say right now, I mean, this is again uh, very probably very new news to most people in this world. But uh, I would say that 70% of the proteins in the universe, or in in the human, or sorry, or in the human, or in any organism, uh, are not amenable to these experimental techniques. A lot of them are memory inbound. So extraying them, I can't even get to that. So to do extraying them experiments, you need to have you know nice crystallization. You need to have very well behaved proteins. So I I right now estimated you know when I started doing this work, I thought it was 90% that 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 most proteins were well behaved, and now I think only 30% of proteins are well behaved. They need the environment to fold in. They need the rest of the, the context to 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 do to form the structure. And so we use hybrid techniques. So we take some data from experiment, we combine it with the computational methods, and then uh, and then we do an. I mean, again, I can go into very much detail to this, but we do a hybrid simulation, and that turns out to again produce results that are as accurate, almost as accurate as experiment. And when I say those things, I mean I'm not. Okay, actually, uh, yeah, one of the points I want to make right there is is that uh, because this is a basis of all our methods that we're developing and it's an, it's an algorithmic issue, but one of the things is that the more distance constraints that we have or the more we know about distances between atoms, the more we can specify what the structure looks like. And as you add more and more distance constraints, you can get to the structure, and this has been published in many places. But but um, we we've shown that you know one distance constraint for every ten amino acids, that is two amino acids separated very far away from each other, uh, can get you a low resolution. We call this a low resolution fold, and one distance constraint for every six amino acids, uh, six residues, because residue is part of a protein, um, then uh, we you, we can get something that matches experimental accuracy. So that's a point that, that we use in all our methods. And, uh, and uh, okay. So why is this such a hard, hard problem? Why is this so hard? Okay. So let's, let's, let's go back to that. And so the normal prediction. So the idea is just we, our approach is sample confirmational studies such that needle like confirmations are found. So if I go back right here to that slide, actually it's already there, but um, if I go back here, right here, and I show you this unfolded protein, it has degrees of freedom. It has actually two degrees of freedom, we call the phi and the psi angle. They can twist around 360 degrees. And they can't really twist around 360 degrees because there are other atoms interfering with it. So we know what the distributions that they can go around, and we use that as part of our simulation process. So, yeah. So the, our our approach is to I'll actually I'll actually skip a lot of this. Our approach then is to uh, is to. Yeah, our approach is to um, basically sample. This is a huge confirmation space. When you think about it, it's an actually infinite confirmation space. If you allow all 360 angles and all real numbers, but even if you say that there are five states per protein, and sorry, per amino acid, and you allow you have a small protein like 100 amino acids, which is a small domain, as, as I just said, that's uh, five to the hundred possibilities which is more than what we can look at and and uh, that's equal to 10 to 70 and you know you're, you guys are astro astrobiologists and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this 
but the last estimate I heard about the number of atoms in the universe was about 10 to the 69. So, uh, so this is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So there's no way that the protein has, can, can sample all of this thing. What has happened again is evolution, right? Uh, over time, billions of years, this, this thing has evolved to, to get to its right shape, to perform its right function, and the things, the organisms that don't perform the right functions die out, and the organisms that perform the right function survive, and so on. So evolution has helped guide this process, and we are trying to replicate that in some ways. So you have a huge conformational space, and we can't even look at it because it's so large. So we sample it. We sample it using a variety of energy functions, and we hope that within our sample, there's something that looks like the real answer. And then the second hard problem is to figure out which one it is. That's, that's the selection. And it's very, very, very hard when you have such a large sample size. We right now look at 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 conformations. So more than a billion, easily, all the, always. And it's very, very hard to design a, something, a function, or something that will say, hey, this is the right answer versus all the others. And uh, so this, uh, this is the reason why the structure prediction problem, the protein folding problem is so hard. And um, there's a technique for doing it. I will not get into detail into it. Template-based modeling, I want to say a little bit about it in the sense that what we do is that that's the method. Uh, so I'm skipping the method because, because it requires a lot of knowledge about how we do the simulations. I'm skipping the method. The template method, based method is taking a protein and comparing it to the radio based on known structures. So 45,000, about 45,000 known structures that have been solved by X-ray diffraction or by uh, crystallography. And um, we, want to, we want to use that knowledge. So when we detect a homology or a similarity, then we can use the alignment between them. And we can come up with an initial model. And then we can, we can, we can actually use that initial model. Again, I'm going very fast on this, this, this part of it. We can use that as a template for guiding what our structure will finally look like. And uh, we have methods to do that. We have a lot of techniques. I spent 14 years, like I said, of my life doing this myself. And um, and the main thing is that when you construct a homology model, this thing actually looks like that. And you want to move it to what this real answer looks like. And it's very hard to do that right now. It's an unsolved problem until last year, where we were one of the first people to do that where we could actually move something that was, like, say, three angstroms away from the correct answer to two angstroms away to the real answer. So I want to give you some results now, actually. So I, sh I should probably have skipped all the method slides. But um, so we get assessed every two years where this competition has become a competition. It's called CASP. Uh, and uh, what happens is that the modelers get sequences of proteins that are not being published or are in the process of being solved. So, so they're about to be solved. So we, we get all the sequences in, say, May, April or May during, we call it the, the CASP season. And then, and then, uh, and then the, the crystallographers and MR spectroscopists are working very hard on getting the right answer. And we try to predict the structure. And then this is blind prediction. What has happened in the past is that people have claimed to have solved this problem many, 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 many times. So the literature is filled with uh, my mentors. Actually, you know, it, it's it's a big joke. But but uh, the literature is filled with uh, people who have said that you know they take a t set of ten proteins and they write a program to work on it, and it usually fails to try to fold the structure, and then they tweak their program to work, make it work better, and by doing so they introduce knowledge about the test set into their algorithm, and they keep doing that, and, and finally it really works very well on their ten test proteins that they're looking at, but then when they're giving an unknown protein, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not able to do so well. So John Mark, my first mentor, came up with the idea of doing this structure prediction in a blind way. So this is known as CASP, and this is the competition that I'm talking about. So uh, we do very well in these rankings and so on. So what I'm showing you on the left is the real answer, and what I'm showing you on the right is the uh, model that we produced. So here, when you have something that is 60% similar, that is not 60% not similar, 60% identical in terms of amino acids, you can produce something that's almost as good as experimental resolution. That means that if you took the structure and solved it in two different labs, 
you will probably get something that, that is about this much uh, CFR MST. But we are not interested in the 60% one. Well, we are, but, but those are the easy ones. Let's go into 25%, because then there's a lot of divergence in the sequence, but the structures, like I said, are more conserved than sequence. Here's another prediction where we detect that, and we say, hey, look, this, this actually is this thing, and, and here we get a 2.2 angstrom uh, prediction for something that's 25% uh, similar. Here's another one, 2.0 um, angstrom for something that's 23% uh, similar, and here's another result that uh, it's actually 11%. That's all of these, by the way, anything about, about 20 to and below are in, are in the random range. So you could get these hits by chance when you do a side blast. That's, that's what most people do. And uh, so 11% is definitely a random kind of hit. But even then, these two proteins are structure related. If you actually follow the C-alpha traces, you can see that their shapes are kind of similar. And the question is, can you move this back to the real answer? And we're working on that. Uh, I'm showing you four examples here. We usually model about 100 proteins uh, during the CASP season, and we get judged on that, and we get ranked on that. And, and uh, well, I, w I won't tell you what my rankings would be, but, but it's in the top five. Let's put it that way. Uh, it depends on how we look at it. Hmm. OK. Sorry, I'm having some problems with this. Yeah, I'm not used to Mac. Okay. So, given a structure, we want to predict the function. And this is where some of the astrobiological aspects come in. So, what we've developed is a, is a, is a function. So, I've, I'm, I'm in the Department of Microbiology. And they had me. I mean, I'm glad they had me because I personally, there were, there were a lot of biochemistry and biophysics departments that wanted to hire me. Um, all over the country, and uh, I chose microbiology at the UW because I thought they would challenge me, and they did. They said, okay, so you give me the structure, so what? What can I do with it? And so we, give, we went into structure, we went into function, because we believe that the structure determines function. I mean, that's a, it's a fundamental rule, so we want to get, to get at the function. So now we started developing new scoring functions that Aaron is partly working on in, in effect, to try to predict the function of what the pro of a given protein does. And so we we got this function. This is the early version of scoring function, and actually has a correlation coefficient of 0.7 to explicitly determine binding affinity to some metal ion to uh, uh, to the score that we predict. So that's pretty good. That means that we can start predicting proteins with ions. Actually, ions in general in crystal structures or you know, MR structures don't have a resolution. You can't resolve them, what kind of ions they are or where, what, where they are. And uh, we can actually say that we can get them. Here I'm showing you four examples again. So here the yellow is actually doesn't matter. The yellow is the correct answer and the blue is our prediction and they're overlapping. So we are predicting calcium ions uh, in proteins. Also calcium is a big regulator of most most biological functions. Uh, I have epilepsy, for example, and I can tell you that that there's a deficiency in calcium every time I have it, uh, have a seizure. And so, so we can predict the the the, uh, the accuracy of calcium ions to 0 0.05 or angstroms RMST very 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 accurately. So I mean that's what I mean by that. I mean we're on top of pretty much on top, and the 130 test cases that we looked at. And then we are looking at something called metafunctional signature. So this is more of a biophysics-based approach, but this is combining uh, sequence. So most biologists would only look at this column right here. They look at sequence conservation within a family of sequences and say, hey, this looks, this is conserved throughout this whole family, so this must be important. But, but then what happens if you have two evolutionary lineages that have diverged? You have plants and you have animals. And it's conserved among plants, and it's not conserved among an animals. So in the plants, it does pro it probably does do the function, but in animals, maybe it's not so important anymore. So we take that into account. And then we take the structure. I won't talk about the stack. 
we take the structure into account. One of the things that 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 from a physical point of view is that anything that needs to do a function is not structurally stable. So anything that that is important for structure has to be important for function. So if you put an R gene in the middle of a protein and de it destabilizes the protein, it it will unfold and it will cause a loss of function because it completely destroys the protein. So anything that's structurally important for the protein is is important for the function, but the reverse doesn't hold. Anything that is functionally important is actually the the other way around. It's functionally frustrated. So we published a paper on PNX on this, where we show that when the function actually occurs, then it's happy. But until then, it's actually not happy. That the amino acid or the amino acid involved in this, it's weak, we call it functional frustration. So we use that into account in our in our stability measurements and. This, these energy functions that we're using are based on the same principles that we used to do the protein structure prediction. So, and then we can see that of the thousand test cases that we're looking at, we're getting near 100, um, almost 100 percent prediction on predicting which which residues are functionally important. And this is in 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 fact, I want to I want to bring up this point. This is what Aaron's actually developing and working on and improving. And it has two relevances to, to astrobiology. One is that, you know, from my perspective, I mean, I'm a biologist or a computational biologist. I want to know how things bind. I want to design new drugs and things like that. But we can design new proteins with this. We can design functionally new proteins that have the properties that we want based on the functional signatures. And if you want to seed life on another planet, say you look at extreme environments on this on this on this planet, and say uh, uh, you know these, these thermophiles or these uh, yeah these thermophilic bacteria. Actually, Aaron's looked at this. Um, do a particular function, and that they actually differ in this functional signature, and we can replicate that aspect of it, but still keep it structurally stable. So we use that the same same approach. I mean we use the structural prediction with the functional prediction to 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 try to design new proteins. And that's an astrobiological application of what Aaron is doing. Then like I said, life is complex, right? We proteins don't just work by themselves, they work with interactions. This is a case where we found cubulins and bacteria. This was actually done with Jim Staley, it's a paper I co published who's in the astrobiology department. Um, where we actually predicted the structure to 2.8 angstrom, res sorry, 2.18 angstroms uh, for the monomer, 2.28 angstroms for the dimer, which is really a great prediction in terms of structure before the structure was solved. So Jim Staley found tubulins in, in the prostacobacteria, and uh, he gave me these, these genes and he said, What does it look like? Do you think that they actually interact? And I actually said, I looked at the structure and I didn't. Uh, I said actually they were not right? So that, that was my visual inspection. And actually if you go back to the metafunctional signature here, it actually predicts that they would interact. So what, what, I, what was I missing? I was missing the evolution in lineage of what was happening. So the things that I thought were important changes were not important at all because you see them happening all the time in other eukaryotes and so on. So I was so so the, the the algorithm, the computer algorithm, was actually more accurate predicting whether these dam rises and they find form microfilaments and so on. And Jim is pursuing this, uh, and uh, uh, and this was a 35% identity. So we actually got the model right. We got the structural model right, but we couldn't get the function of, of function right. But now we can with the new methods that we have, and we can also do the same thing with protein DNA interactions. So here you have a transcription factor bound to DNA per water. We can now we can completely model the lack of prime. I'm, I hope. Well, if you're not well, I just. But um, so I'll, I'll skip that part of it. But there's there's a, if you know about it, there's something called the lack of lack operon, which is used as a as a as a reporter system in many many organisms. We can completely model that at an atomistic atomistic level of detail and get everything right. And um, one of the things that we found is that one of the things that we are that's special about what we are doing is that we put dynamics into our process. So we let the proteins and the let's say two proteins or the protein and the DNA or the protein and the substrate bind with and move each other and then measure their scores. And uh, this is a 
correlation with the experimental binding energy, and this is the docking energy or the calculated energy, and you can see the correlation coefficient is point almost point nine, and uh, that turns out to be um, if you didn't do it without the dynamics, it would be 0.35. That's random. So proteins, substrates, DNA, all of these things are constant thermal motion, and you take dynamics into account when you do this modeling. So that's something that we're big on doing. So putting it all together, put, put all the structure, the functions, and the interactions together. So now, until then, until now, I've been talking about single molecules. Here's the network. So you start getting networks. You see where the interactions are occurring. This is an example uh, interaction network in tuberculosis. And um, we are looking only at 107 proteins with uh, you know, 762 unique interactions. And you can actually look at it. They form what we call these hubs in date nodes. That's, that's the language that's being used. So these hubs are pr crucial drug targets. And again, if you want to design a new organism that would survive in the extreme environment, you would need something like this hub out there. Um, and then uh, the date nodes, we also find these articulation points to be important for the survival of the organism. And that was just in one example, a uh, little bit formatting problem here, but uh, uh, we're looking at 26,000 proteins in human, and uh, we're looking at, for 17,000 of them, we can predict 828,000 interactions and 1 million um, transcription regulatory interactions, that is protein-DNA interactions. So, and like I said, uh, rice is one of my major finding sources, so we look at six rice streams, and we are trying to actually re-engineer rice to have a whole wide of uh, bioavailable nutrients. This is part of the Gates Foundation uh, uh, effort. So the, the idea is that people who eat rice in most Asian countries don't get all the nutrients they need. So can we actually engineer all of this? And we don't want to do this through genetic modifications like the golden rice thing, because that is not socially acceptable or politically acceptable. So we want to do it through marker assist braining. That means that you need to know the functions of these networks and how these networks mix together. So in sum, we can predict functions for more than 50% of proteum, approximately 10 more million protein-protein interactions and protein uh, uh, interactions. The, when I give you these numbers, we can benchmark the accuracy, and we've done it. I mean, we, we have a gold standard test set, and we can benchmark that. And uh, uh, you know, the, the more accurate you get, the more, less the coverage. But if you want 50% accuracy, which is what you actually expect in high throughput is to hybrid experiments, then then uh, then we can. This is what we can do. We can we can. Those are the numbers right there. Um, we, it's useful in identifying functions because things that are in white, we don't know the function of in E. coli or in tuberculosis, for example, in this case. And we can look at it and look and see what it interacts with, and we can predict it interacts with that and that it maybe does the same kind of function. And we can predict what are essential for the organism. So if you want to design a new organism that, that is useful in, in some other environment, we can, we can, we can, we can do that. And we can also predict host passage interactions. That's again a microbiology issue. Uh, like I said, we benchmark all of this. So, what are we doing? I mean, we're combining all of this data. We combine the individual structure, stru structure, function, interaction data with the genome-wide data, the gene array and the functional genomics data. And here's a simple example of what happens. This is a lack of protein. Protein interacts the transcription factor. It binds to the DNA. It Codes the thing, codes the mRNA, that interacts with the protein, and this is a feedback loop. And in, a, in, essential, in a sense, you as an organism and we as organisms are one big, large feedback loops. So, so there's that, that's what we're trying to replicate. And we're integrating a lot of data to do this. And uh, since I'm getting uh, out of time, one of the things that we do believe in is making all our algorithms and all our um, uh, work public, uh, at least available on the web, so other biologists can use them. Uh, and Mike Gherkin, who's sitting there, has uh, created a nice uh, database. He's actually created the web, the web front end of it. This is, a, this, is, this is Google for bioinformatics, and this was before Google came up with Gmail and stuff like that. So Mike was ahead of the curve. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, so he's, he's gotten all this data in there. And these are the URLs for the 
this is uh, URL for all data. We've analyzed 54 podium so far. Uh, I think it's now 65, isn't it right, Mike? Yes, yeah, 65 so far. And then the individual, if you want, you have a single protein and you want to look at it, you can go to these uh, servers and they will predict the function structure. Uh, and they give you a lot of detail about all these things. You can actually visualize these interaction graphs using a web browser. Again, the whole goal is to make everything life, life easy for biologists. I'm going to go a little over time here, but I want to talk about some of the applications of what we're doing. So we've done some drug discovery work. So we predicted molecules that bind to a herpes proteus. There is no known herpes proteus inhibitor. Uh, all herpes drugs are what you call uh, nucleoside analogs. They are like, to use an analogy, they're like, the, like HIV uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That is like HIV, like, um, it's the first HIV drug, I forget. Um, but but then you combine them and you form a cocktail. So I'm sure you're familiar with the, the concept of the HIV cocktail. And that's what works against us. So so, so we we have the first uh, herpes inhibitor that, uh, protease inhibitor, that would be combined with, with, the, uh, with the current herpes drugs and that could be combined with the current herpes drugs and used as a cocktail. And I have a lot of experimental data so that was a prediction. That the, what you saw, pictures of that, was the pure predictions. I have a lot of experimental data to show that it inhibits HIV replication. All there are eight human herpes viruses. Believe it or not, chickenpox uh, is uh, is is a herpes virus. If you didn't know that, it's a virus of disaster. Uh, cytomegalovirus kills about 10% of transplant patients. Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus is a uh, um, Associated herpes virus is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a something that most people infected with HIV are co-infected with all these herpes viruses. And uh, we, we, we can show that our drugs work better than the current, current drugs are comparable to. And synergistically, synergistically, actually this is a synergy plot, show that it pretty much right here, this is the one where you combine our drug with, with, uh, uh, with acyclovir, the current standard accepted drug, uh, Laltrex is uh, uh, is essentially a, uh, a new patent form of acyclovir, if you want to call it that. Uh, uh, it essentially destroys all virus in a cell culture. So these are cell culture studies. So we are now killing a lot of mice. Uh, I mean, that is infecting a lot of mice with herpes, uh, which actually kills them, and then uh, and then seeing uh, what happens with that. So hopefully it will work in mice right now. Uh, we also do this with existing drugs, that is we take existing drugs, again, the reason for doing that is because evolution has reused substrates again and again and again. So existing drugs that work, work better. So we also all have the pharmacology data, the toxic data and so on, and so we use that. So what does this mean? Uh, why, why am I showing you this? Uh, how, well, what, I, I mean, it's interesting from a drug discovery viewpoint. I was recently involved in a grant to regenerate the true tooth. And um, what we can do is our techniques are so general and so broad that we don't have to worry about inhibition of a particular protein. We can induce a particular protein to do something. And we can actually have a set of compounds. When people talk about the RNA world or the DNA world or whatever, whatever hypothesis that you believe in that originated in life, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen like that. There were other small molecules involved. In fact, there were probably a lot of other small molecules involved. And you need all these small molecules to induce the gene expression signature that you want to make the organism survive. And we can do that. We can induce a particular gene expression signature using these small molecule techniques, uh, docking techniques that we developed. I, I hope that point is very clear to, to, to everyone. I mean, we, yeah. I mean, it, it, there, were, there were other molecules. It wasn't just RNA and DNA and proteins or what came first or what came later. There were, there were other molecules, a lot of biological substrates that made life on Earth possible. And those are ex extremely essential if you want to talk about astrobiology and seeding life on other planets and so on. Okay? And then nanotechnology. So here's another case where this is even more abstract, and this actually has relevance to extreme environments and so on, where we, I mean, so what I said to you before is, is our predictions that have been completely verified by experiment 
completely match with what we see experimentally. So it's one thing to talk about computational modeling and you know publish a lot of papers on computational modeling, but if you don't get it verified by experimental, by observation, then then it, it's meaningless as far as I'm concerned. That's why CASP was initiated and so the herpes stuff that I showed you was an example. We've done this for malaria, for dengue, and we can show that experimentally that that these these results that the predictions that we make are not completely accurate, but still fairly in the top uh, top range. Again, this is a case where we predict uh, small um, peptides of proteins that bind to inorganic substrates. So we are a carbon life uh, based form. Uh, we are we are carbon based. Uh, we are a life form that's carbon based, but uh, there could be silica based car uh, life forms like they're called computers, <laughs> but, uh, but there could be other, 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 other life forms that, that you might think of that are not carbon-based. And we can design enzymes and proteins to get around that, and we've done that. And in this case, particular case, we actually look at quads and design of new proteins that bind to quads that don't have functions that have never been observed in nature yet. And we show that these bind to quads as predicted um, the best one that was discovered experimentally is in black right here. This was by a lot of experimental techniques, a lot of um, work, and we just do our simulations. We use we use the experimental data. I mean, I have to be honest with you. We use the experimental data as a starting point, and then we do our simulations. And our our strongest binders. This this is again an experimental uh, result. Uh, this is an SPR result. I, I won't go into detail on that. But what you need to just look at is this cover, our first predicted binder, quartz binder, silica binder, is is um, happens to be the strongest one as we predicted. We also did a negative control where we took what we thought were the weakest binders, and we show that there's a clear separation. So we might be off on S4 and S5 right here, but still, you know, it's it's still consistent. I mean, there's a very clear separation. In fact, I would say this is 100% agreement with experiment uh, for predictions. Okay. So what is the future? Uh, I'm a little bit over time, but I, since I started a little late, I can think I have the liberty of that. Um, I'll finish in a minute. So what is the future? The future is that... Um, The future is that we have a lot of structural data coming out. I really believe in the concept of atomic level modeling. So it's Newtonian mechanics at this point. So, um, but I believe that's enough. We don't, I don't think we need to go to quantum physics for trying to understand how proteins work. But but that's that's just my prejudice. But and I could be corrected, uh, and I might be wrong. Uh, but I think that proteins behave on a, on, a, on a Newtonian level, and we can model them like that. So there's a huge amount of atomic level data coming out, and we can exploit the data. There's a huge amount of functional data, experimental data that's coming out. We can exploit that, integrate that into our simulation methods. But the amount of data that's being produced is so large that there is no human brain in this world that can process all of this. You know, the first CASP that was in 1994, where everyone did badly, in 1996 and 1998, there was a human person who did better than all the computers. And that was something that people valued. People were, you know, priding about it, that uh, there was a human who can do better than all the computers. Well, that didn't last very long, because the computers got faster and, and, and smarter in the sense that the programmers uh, wrote better programs. So how do you, I mean, when you're talking about more, much more complex levels of information, so how do you integrate all of this? And how do you give it semantic meanings? And I think computers are the only answer. Even now, when you have used Google, you just have to type in a string and you get some results. You can't ask Google a question and get a result for it. It doesn't give you semantic meaning. It only gives you, gives you a set of results. And what we are trying to produce in the bioverse that Mike is working on is to produce the biological model. And when, you, when we can do that, going back to the astrobiology aspects of it, when we can do that, we can engineer new organisms, we can engineer new organisms from other plants, we can engineer organisms in any, any, any environment. I mean, this is, this is still a long way away, but we are, that's, that's uh, what our researchers directed towards, and those are all the tools that we're developing. So, I, so, so my, the, the fundamental message that I want, to take, I want you guys to take home is that modeling proteins and proteome structure 
and function at the atomic level, at really at the atomic level, at the Newtonian level, is necessary to understand the relations between, you know, single molecules, uh, single functional molecule systems, pathways, cells, and eventually organisms. And um, like I said, this is an older talk. Uh, now I would say modeling proteins and modeling DNA and modeling RNA and small molecules. I want to acknowledge all the people in my group and um, uh, a bunch of them and uh, and this is again an older slide so my collaborators and also my funding uh, sources. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Can you use these methods to model protein folding in weird temperature, pH, and redox conditions? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can. The answer is you can. Whether you'll get it right or not is another issue, but you can. <laughs> I mean, can, may I? Uh, you know, it's it's a yeah. You can do it, and that's one of the points of of trying to identify what are the important residues and how would these residues behave under different conditions. I think that you can. You can use a combination of all this information to do it. Uh, right now it's probably not automatic. It probably has to be done manually and Aaron is again looking at it very in, in very close detail, but it can be done. And that's the whole idea. I mean, that's, that's where we're going towards. And I can tell you that uh, John Lee has worked with me and we're trying to model some of his proteins and it's been really hard for us because he works with extreme, uh, extreme uh, proteins that work in extreme environments and we don't have a lot of data on that. And so a, lo a lot of our approach is knowledge based. So I mean it's a long drawn out answer but as we get more and more data, as John produces more data, we can, we can incorporate that data into our simulation protocols. So it's, it's, a, it's a collaboration between experimentalists and computational biologists. It's an iterative process. Sure. What do you think is the near term future for <coughs> understanding the function of the 40 to 50 percent of the unknown reading train uh, active proteins that are? I think we can understand the function. I mean, again, <laughs> what do you mean by understanding function? I mean, so this, this goes into why we developed the functional signature approach. So the functional signature is a word coined, I would say, by, by us, by our group. Um, so you talk about immunoglobulins. What do they do? They bind to antigens. But what do they also do? They are part of your defense system. What do you call it? What, what do you call that function as? English is not enough to describe the function of a protein. So it needs to be mathematical. And I would say that we can actually model the function of about more than 50% of a given podium right now. Um, and as, again, as more experimental data is available, we can keep incorporating that uh, into our simulations. And that, that's, we need the experimental data. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and our methods are developed to handle that. But function, the word function is, is, is actually very arbitrary. And if you go by English language definitions, I think it's actually a wrong one. We need quantitative definitions of functions. That's a good point, but I, I think what, what I'm also sort of driving at is you have a, a finite number of what appear to be structural options in yep. your protein. Absolutely. That, that's so the other way. Why, have, why have we not been able to actually predict, I, I hate to use the word function, but, but we have. The application of that particular protein to a living organism. But we have, and that's... That's that's what that's that's what happens when you take the evolutionary history of the organism into account. That when you took take the fact that the that functionally important amino acids are functionally frustrated, that that is structurally frustrated. That is, they're they're not stable until they're in the functional form, and our accuracy improves a lot. And there's probably a few other factors that we're missing that we don't know yet. And again, it's part of our thesis. So. Uh, yeah, but but that's but we have we 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 are probably among among the first people to do that, where where we are able to take things that look the same. You would think they do the same function, but they don't. We know they don't. Yeah. I'll ask another kind of bizarre question. I'm looking at your network of the proteome where they're all interacting. With mm -hmm. I started thinking about. Think about the human one. It's it's about uh, three million. Thinking about prions, 
how a prion protein can actually affect a structural change in another protein. Would you like to discuss that from an evolutionary perspective, for example? Well, so, you know, so we, in a, in a sense, we're cherry picking. You know, we, I, I, I'm good at doing that. Let's, let, let's put it that way. We are, we are picking the low hanging fruit. So do you, I mean, information, so you're, you know, in, in, in a sense, all of this is information transfer, right? So we go to and entropy and things like that, and everything's about information transfer. So we're transferring information from ourselves to our progeny and so on. And prions, um, well, Stanley Prisoner won the Nobel Prize for that, uh, is, is a way of transferring information. And uh, can we model it? Actually, we, we can. We can model that, that process fairly well. That's a well-established process. But again, it's one of those cases where um, there's not nothing else besides prions like that. You know, so it's, 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 it could be an over-testing case, you know, I mean, or uh, over-training, over-training case. So we can, we can, I can take a, you know, prion protein which adopts two conformational states and I can make it adopt into one conformational state and I can see how it induces other protein conformational changes. And I can predict all of that in simulation. But then I have the right answer in front of me. But maybe I wrote the algorithm to make the right answer. You know, how do you be honest with yourself with that situation? We can have discussions about that. Yeah. Yeah, being, 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 I think that that I mean, I mean, since since such a such a general audience, I think that is that is really the main issue. I think it's really important to be uh, very, very, very honest and self-critical. I think we we suffer from that in the computation field. You know, even uh, what's what's his name, Robert Milligan, he did the oil drop experiment. Just just going back to physics astronomy, you know, he he dropped data points from his plot just to show that he was right. But he was right. He was right about the charge of electron. But uh, I do not encourage that. All right. If there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Ram very much for...